as a kid, if you asked me what I thought about weddings, there's a pretty good chance you may have got a mixed response. Whereas I liked the receptions and the food that typically came with them, when it came to the ceremony itself, I mostly have memories of trying to sit still in hot churches, uh, waiting for the bride to show up so we could just get this whole thing on the road. As I got older, however, I, I began to enjoy weddings more and more. I began to see them as, as beautiful and fun and, and a celebration of togetherness. Now Jesus, he seemed to like weddings too. Uh, from his very first miracle, being a beautiful wedding gift to a bride and a groom, to some of his best loved imagery pointing to a heavenly wedding, Jesus seemed to have a real thing for love stories. And today, I'd like to take a look at one of them with you. It's from Matthew 25. So Jesus and his disciples are sitting on the side of the Mount of Olives one evening, and looking below, they see a house, a light streaming from the openings, uh, and, and expectant people everywhere. A marriage procession is about to come through. Now in those days, the bridal party would proceed by torchlight from the father's house to the groom's house, where a feast would be laid out in celebration. Now, Jesus looks out, and he sees ten young women in white robes waiting for the procession, and he tells his friends a story. Eugene Peterson, in the message, tells it like this. He says, God's kingdom is like ten young virgins who, who took oil lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Now, five were silly and five were smart. The silly virgins took lamps, but no extra oil. The smart virgins took jars of oil to feed their lamps. Now, the bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him, and they all fell asleep. In the middle of the night, someone yelled out, He's here! The bridegroom's here! Go and greet him! The ten virgins got up, got their lamps ready, and the silly virgin said to the smart ones, Our lamps are out! Lend us some of your oil! And they answered, There might not be enough to go around. Go buy your own! And they did. But while they were out buying oil, the bridegroom arrived. And when everyone was there to greet him, and they'd gone into the wedding feast, the door was locked. Now much later, the other virgins, the silly ones, showed up and knocked on the door saying, Master, we're here, let us in. And he answered, Do I know you? I don't think I know you. So stay alert. You have no idea when he might arrive. Oh, what a story. Uh, the crazy thing is that as Jesus is sitting there on the hillside with his friends, his mind is actually on us. Uh, you and me today, uh, the church that will live just before his second coming. But the thing that makes me pause, and should make you pause too, is that, that Jesus says in these last days there's two different groups of people that make up the church. There's the wise virgins and the foolish ones. But what's he talking about here? What's the difference between the two groups? See, the story of the ten virgins brings out this beautiful imagery of oil and lamps and lights shining in the night. And we've talked often about shining our lights in the world. You know, Jesus himself said, You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, what I love about the story of the wise and the foolish virgins is that it shows us this beautiful truth. And that is, we don't shine to the world primarily because we have to. The main reason we let our light shine to the world is that because we are celebrating the marriage of the groom, Jesus, and his bride, the church, which is us. I mean, when it comes down to it, when you stop and think about it for even a minute, can you even wrap your mind around such a love story? A story of a God who loves so deeply that He looked beyond our faults and our mess-ups and our, and our just straight-up poor choices and saw instead the bride that He loved. How Jesus, even though it cost Him everything, including His very life, He couldn't bear the idea of eternity without us, and so He laid down His life as a payment for the choices that we'd made. Now check out the prologue from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, as it just lays it out so beautifully. He says, In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Did you follow that? In Jesus was life, and that life in Jesus was the light of men. And this light shines brightly in the darkness, and the darkness just has no idea what to do with it. We shine because Jesus is our source of life. We shine in celebration of the most beautiful wedding this world's ever seen. And so, what was the difference between the two groups of people? The difference in the story between the five wise and the five foolish virgins is this. One group came prepared with enough oil to last no matter how long it took. And one group came 
only ready for what they expected. So, what then is the oil? Oil in the Bible represents the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes our lamps burn bright. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who empowered the early church as they exploded on the scene in the midst of heavy persecution from all sides. The same Holy Spirit who came upon the apostles at Pentecost and helped them speak to the great crowds of people in Jerusalem for the festivities in a way that each person listening heard the gospel spoken in their own language. This is the same Holy Spirit who worked with Peter and John to bring the crippled beggar to his feet and poor old Dorcas back to life again. This is the same Holy Spirit who lights our lamps and shines through us with joy and celebration. But some of the girls ran out. Why? I mean, all ten girls had lamps and containers for oil. It seemed for a while that there was no difference between them. And it's the same with us today. All of us in the church, we know about the Bible. We, we all know that we're living near the time of the end and that Jesus is coming soon. But the thing is, Jesus' return is delayed, just like he warned us in the story. Not because of logistical problems or because he forgot, but First Peter tells us it's so that all might be saved. But the waiting is uncomfortable. Sometimes it can be hard to keep the faith in the face of waiting. And just like in the story, when we hear, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, some of us are out of oil. We're unready. We're empty of the Holy Spirit. See, without the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if we know the Bible. This beautiful, life-changing gospel truth without the Holy Spirit is, is just an interesting theory. See, the five foolish uh, virgins, they aren't hypocrites. They love the truth. They've spoken for it even. They haven't let the Holy Spirit control their lives though. They haven't given their whole lives to Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit works on our hearts, but only as much as we let Him. See, the foolish group, they've let God clean them up on the outside, and they've left it there. And so their whole spirituality is nothing more than a tradition. And, and here's the thing, in spiritual things, one person's relationship with God can't make up for another person's lacking. God's grace has been freely offered to every person. Like Revelation 22:17 says, whoever wants it, let them drink of the water of life freely. But I can't drink it for you. You have to drink of the water by yourself. And that's the problem, isn't it? It's not that the five wise virgins didn't want to share their oil. It's that they couldn't. A person's walk with God isn't something that can be transferred one to another. You know, my grandpa, he had a great walk with God. It wasn't perfect, but it was one that if you knew him well, you'd want it for yourself. You know, he loved his precious friend Jesus, and he desperately wanted to be light for the world around him, that they might see Jesus shining through him and look to the cross and be saved. He prayed faithfully every day for our whole family and everybody else on his considerably long prayer list. And you could tell that he knew Jesus because he carried with him many of those same traits. Gentleness, compassion, caring, love of laughter, and relationships. And yet, despite all that, he couldn't transfer his own personal experience with God to any of us whom he loved. We couldn't inherit those moments that he spent deep in conversation with his blessed Redeemer. We couldn't borrow his oil. But we could be inspired by his light. And having seen his walk with Jesus, and my dad's, and the way that my mom just grasped onto Jesus' hand to carry her through such tremendous losses that she's faced, it's placed me on a far better path than any amount of fire or brimstone or legalistic finger pointing ever could because seeing Jesus live in those who've gone before and with me, it makes me want what they have. And wanting what they have, that, that life that is the light of all men has brought me to the cross for myself. You know, and having met Jesus for myself, I've been inspired to dig into the Word day after day for most of my life now. And it's not a burden. It's a, it's a joy. 
It's pure delight as I get to know my friend and Savior more and more, and every day walk closer with Him than the day before. See, that's how, in this all-consuming pandemic, we can look beyond the darkness that presses in and instead still find great joy and meaning and purpose in the great commandment and the great commission, which is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, and, and to go into all the world making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the things that Jesus commanded, and then experiencing that assurance that He's with us even until the end of the age. Shine your light of celebration and joy even in the face of darkness, but don't forget your fuel source because as so many have discovered, once that oil runs out, the dark feels even darker. And so the real question then is this, how will you deliberately plan your days so as to have your fire fueled by the Holy Spirit? In other words, how will you plan your days so that you can experience and be filled by God every single day? This is something we need to be intentional about. It's not something that just accidentally happens. Uh, so much of the time these days we go around feeling like, like we're just running on empty. Like someone asks you how you're doing and you say, ah, tired. <laughs> uh, but those times they don't have to leave us empty. We can figure out how to cultivate our daily uh, oil, intentionally arranging our days with the purpose of experiencing the presence of God. You know, for me right now, I've been enjoying a new style of Bible reading plan that I haven't tried before. It's, it's a, a chapter or so of the New Testament in the morning and a couple at night, and it keeps me fresh and, and uh, filled and starting and ending my day with God. Uh, another thing I've picked up again is daily practicing the presence of uh, benevolent detachment, which is basically giving things over to God in prayer. Uh, you just take a minute or longer if you have the time to soak in some Jesus and ask Him two things. Number one, what do I need to release to you today, Jesus? And number two, what is it that I need from God today? What do I need to release to you? And what do I need from you? And when you spend a bit of time and just quiet your heart and listen for Jesus leading, you know, there's nothing like it. This giving everyone and everything to Jesus, like really doing it because, I mean, he's, he's better. <laughs> He's more reliable. He's stronger than, than I ever could be. He could take better care of these things that I love than I ever could. And I encourage you to try this. Uh, all this just goes to keep that oil flowing, right? That oil of experiencing God's presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as your oil is cultivated day after day, your light will continue to shine uh, with beauty and gladness. And though the groom may tarry, and darkness press all around on that wonderful day when we hear the shout, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, you'll be ready. Your lamp will be trimmed, that life which is the light of all men. Your oil will be plentiful, that lifetime of experiencing Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And when you get to that courtyard door, instead of a barred door and assuredly I say I never knew you, the bridegroom will throw the gate open. And with all the familiar warmth of a longtime friend and loved one, this, and the Spirit and the Bride will say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come, and whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely.